G'day Year 11, welcome to another lesson. We are going to be looking at family and kinship today, which is lesson 4, which is on page 10. So our syllabus stop point today is the influence of family and kinship on the development of personal and social identity. So what we're going to do, as you can see uh, through the next few lessons here, from lessons 4 to lesson 8, we're going to be looking at different concepts in terms of how they influence the development of personal and social identity. All of these can be considered socialization agents. So if we look at our syllabus, I'll just show you where it is. So here is the part. So the influence of each of the following on the development of personal and social identity. So we've got to look at how all of these impact your personal and social identity and by extension their role as agents of socialization and how they influence how you grow up as well. So we're going to be looking at a bit of that uh, for the next few lessons. So without further ado, page 10. So lesson um, to start with, we've got classic word bank, know you all love them. So the idea behind these again is that you're getting your core notes down don't forget that each dot point is a point that you then need to summarize in your big boy book. Okay, and I will be checking for those. And it's the same here with the socialization process from last lesson and things like that. Okay, so we should have three main summary points here. For family and kinship, we should have two main summary points here that I want you to put in your big boy book. Once you've done that, I want to talk about something called the politics of birth order. I guess, actually, before I retract, I'll talk about what kinship is. So family, we obviously know they play the most important role in the socialization process and the identity formation of individuals. So if you're growing up in a large or smaller family, that may impact the dynamic. But generally speaking, family is what we would call a primary socialization agent. Um, so there are primary socialization agents and secondary socialization agents. So a primary socialization agent is someone in your immediate world that has, and it can be a micro or meso impact, is something that has a stronger impact than a secondary. So for example, a primary socialization agent um, typically consists of family, peers, generally school as well. They're the three main things that shape it. But then there are other things depending on the lifestyle of the individual. So if you grow up in a religious family, you may likely have a church or religion as another uh, primary socialization agent. If your family is massive on, on sport, that might be it for you. But generally the top three for most people are family, friends and your school. Now secondary socialization agents are things that affect how you grow up in your identity that are outside of your immediate family friends and school. So things like your workplace can affect uh, your views and thoughts and how you grow up and affect your identity, but it's not necessarily the biggest and most important factor. So I just wanted to distinguish between those two things. Even if you could actually write a little bit, go back and rewatch, I guess, my explanation of the primary and secondary socialization agent. That was something um, I should have talked about in the last lesson, but because you're all watching them, I'll get you to rewind this video and write a brief difference, I guess, on the primary and secondary socialization agents. So in your book, write something like the difference between primary and secondary socialization agents, and then you would write um, what I was talking about, how the primary socialization agents are the most important contributors to social and personal identity, things like family, peers and school, or religion if, if, if you're that way inclined. And then secondary agents are ones that have a big impact, um, but not as large as family. So things like the workplace uh, or even social media. Okay, so get that in your books. This will be a good test to see who's actually watching and who's not. Um, all right, without further ado, so family, we're pretty understanding of what the family type means, but kinship. So the idea of kinship essentially is you've got your immediate family, right? Your um, you know, parents, siblings, if you have them. Your kinship is looking at 
a mixture, I guess, of people that are family. So it can be aunties, uncles, etc., that are extended family. But even people like close friends or something, you may have a close kinship with them. So family is sort of like your immediate absolute micro household and kinship is all the other parts of family or friends that are really, really close to you, but you just don't live with. Um, now, what I want to talk about something here is called the politics of birth order. So essentially, there is a commonly held social construct um, based on the notion of power authority that comes to siblings due to something called the birth order. So below, I've got three statements here that reflect the politics of birth order. The youngest is always spoilt and gets away with absolutely everything. So you may agree or disagree with that. So the idea that the youngest... Um, is always spoiled. So that's the idea of, I know when I was growing up, say I'm the middle child, so I've got middle child syndrome, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. But say I had to wait for a certain age to get a phone, but my little brother and little sister, when I got a phone, maybe you know a week or two later, they got a phone. And so this idea that the youngest people are always spoiled, they get everything they want, is this commonly held social construct of the birth order. Then the second social construct we've got is this concept of middle child syndrome, which is 100% not a social construct. Um, it is, but I'd like to think it's not. Um, you know, sympathy and shout out to all my middle childs watching this video. I feel your pain. Um, so middle child syndrome is the belief uh, that middle children are excluded, ignored, or even outright neglected because of their birth order. So the idea that you're not the oldest, you know, you're not the first kid, um, the pride and joy, but you're not the youngest, you're not this cute, spoiled one, you're the middle one. You're the, you're the guy that gets all the hand-me-downs, um, the one that's overlooked for everything, the one that's sort of just left to their own devices, right? So that's the social construct of the birth order. And then the last one is that firstborns or the eldest um, are what we call the golden child or the favorite. And they get the most amount of respect and admiration from their parents because they were the first one born. So a lot of the social constructs that miss surrounding that is that because they were the first child, they're given the most um, the high social status of power and authority within the family as well. I know I call my big brother the golden child. That's his nickname. Um, and the idea is that, they, again, they get the most respect and admiration from their parents. They can do no wrong um, and all that sort of thing. So what I want you to do is examine that politics of birth order. I want you to tell me where you sit on the birth order. Are you a firstborn, a middle child, or the youngest? Or are you, you might even be, say you've got a family of four, you might be neither if you're, so say there's the eldest, then do you, oh, you'd be considered, okay, so if you're in a family of four, the two in the middle would be considered the middle child. Okay, so even if you have an even number, you'd be considered the middle child there, just for clarification. If you're an only child, you're the firstborn. Um, only childs get the, the best thing because they get the firstborn aspect, but they also get the younger spoiled aspect of it too. So they're living the dream. Um, again, a social construct and, and very um, stereotyped there. Um, I want you to tell me as well, does this description match or fit your role in the family? Why or why not? So don't just write yes, because, okay? I need you to fill the lines, give me a proper justification, okay? So a lot of these little questions we are doing is to prep us best for the HSC. Now, obviously you're not gonna get a question like this in your HSC, but the skill of justifying and adding an example and filling the lines in the space is certainly a skill we need. So make sure you do that this week. After you've done that, I want you to consider the following questions about the nature of family and kinship. So how might family size impact an individual's socialization? Provide examples, again, filling the lines. So family size, we're looking at, again, you might look at how an only child may impact the individual's socialization. They might have a lack of social skills or whatever it is because they haven't had that interaction. A common um, conception with only children is that they're not very good at sharing things like that then you've got the dynamic of how might having five six seven siblings living in the under one house what impact could that have on you growing up right so there's obviously could be some financial um, strain or burden there um, you get very used to living in closed quarters and loud spaces all that sort of thing 
I want you to talk about how a family size may impact an individual's socialization. So how does it impact them growing up? Okay, provide me some examples. After you've done that, I want you to complete this table, list the advantages and disadvantages of growing up in a family as an only child. So what are the pros and cons? With a sibling of the same gender, pros and cons, and more than four children, the pros and cons. So four children or siblings there. I want you to fill that table out. We'll have some a bit more robust discussion about that in the classroom to really uh, cap off our understanding on Friday. But that is it for lesson four. See you later.